This episode is sponsored by Brilliant.org. Starship updates and SpaceX moon landing schedule. My name is Felix and I am your host for today's episode of What About It. There has been a lot going on in the space industry lately, so let's dive right in. Starship updates. Busy keeping up with an incredibly tight schedule, SpaceX is working around the clock in Boca Chica, Texas to get that Mark 1 prototype ready for its big moment, the 22 km flight. SpaceX has been busy working on the legs a lot. If any part of Starship seems a bit off to me right now, it's the stumpy legs. Starship's diameter is 9 meters and these legs stick out another 40 to 50 centimeters on each side. So the ratio between height and width is very high. This in return gives a landing Starship very little room for error. If it's not completely upright, it can easily tip over as the angle needed for tipping won't need to be that big. Maybe active compensation is the key here. Each leg might extend to a slightly different length on landing, so that the Starship always stands perfectly upright. To ensure this, we would need a variable system and this system might be in the process of being installed right now. As you can see in the picture, SpaceX has been busy lately installing a strange looking mechanism inside the leg mounts. Now this mechanism is on one side attached to the top of the leg and on the other side to the leg housing. Then there is this apparatus in the middle with four long metal plates going through it. There are also presumably pressure pipes attached to it on one side on the top and the bottom. This most likely is a braking mechanism. Pressure goes in on one side, pushing a braking pad against the four metal plates and in return squeezing the whole package together. Then when Starship comes down, the flight computer senses the pressure put on each leg in combination with the alignment of the hull towards the ground and then accordingly to the data breaks the legs so each retracts only so much that the Starship sits perfectly upright. This would also negate the need for crush blocks as the brakes would also work as a dampening system. So the only thing really missing here would be a retraction system for the legs. You cannot use a system similar to the Falcon boosters as they need to be raised up again after flipping down manually after every launch. Starship though would need to be able to do this on its own while in flight to be able to retract its legs again after takeoff from the Martian surface. So we might still see some sort of piston being attached to the top of the legs for that. There's one more possible system it could be besides an ordinary braking system. Why not use in-house tech? The same way how they will use Tesla batteries and motors, they could also use tech from another one of Elon Musk's endeavors. What you can see here is the linear braking and acceleration mechanism on a Hyperloop concept. Looks awfully similar to the system on Starship's legs. It works with simple copper coils on the outside acting as the stator and exactly those same aluminum bars in the middle as the rotor. By inducing currents into the copper coils, the system acts like an electric motor, making the legs move or stop. In this case, the legs could be precisely moved and there would not be any need for a retraction system as the linear accelerators could do the whole program. Forward, backwards and stop. It could also be a combination of both systems. Brakes for landing and linear accelerators to control the movement. It would be awesome to see yet another technology from one of Elon's companies being integrated into the Starship. And Starship, or at least its tank section, moved to the launch site. Yesterday's road closure was used to move the lower section from the shipyard to the pad. Everything worked out as planned and in the end the tank section was lifted onto the launch mount with Big Barry. The large Leaper crane that was already put to good use stacking and unstacking Starship prior to and after the presentation. Now the nose cone will have to be moved and stacked, fins will have to be mounted and aerodynamic covers will have to be installed. Once the plumbing is connected, everything should be ready for system tests and in the end the highly anticipated 22 km test flight. Huge thanks go out to spadre.com South Padre Island information. He stood in the dunes for hours to film the whole journey for us. And I really hope the mosquitoes weren't too bad. We also spotted the first openings in the hull for RCS thrusters. These three holes most definitely are for the cold gas thrusters that Starship Mark 1 is going to use on its first flight. Later on SpaceX will even replace these with hot gas thrusters, giving later Starships amazing amounts of thrust to correct their orientation in flight. 
Very similar RCS openings can be found on the nose of the now retired space shuttles and on the orbital maneuvering system in the back. These systems are not only needed for a successful landing, but for numerous tasks that the SpaceX Starships are going to perform. Attitude control during re-entry, station keeping in orbit, close maneuvering during docking procedures, control of orientation or pointing the nose of the craft and even backup means of deorbiting are possible solutions where RCS systems are needed. And Starship will need rather strong RCS thrusters. The whole idea of descending down while oriented with the belly down makes flip maneuvers a necessity. Starships will enter the atmosphere with the nose facing up in a 60 degree angle. Then they will have to reorient to have the belly with the integrated heat shield facing down. Then just short before landing the whole craft needs to swing around in a very short time reorienting itself with the thrusters pointing down for a landing burn. A part of this work is done by the Raptor engines. The sea level optimized Raptors in the center are able to gimbal up to 15 degrees. This is not enough though to make the maneuver happen. The RCS system will have to aid them in swinging the whole starship around and to counteract the movement once the ship is in the right position. It will be fascinating to see this happen for the first time and even on the first test flight. SpaceX has already confirmed that Mark 1 will do the belly dive on the first flight. And on later crewed versions it will be even more thrilling for passengers inside to experience this maneuver in flight. It will feel like an amusement park ride. An amusement park ride with 750 tons of thrust. And as always, if you liked what you just saw and you want to see more of these updates, click the like and the subscribe button, it helps a lot, thank you. SpaceX Moon Landing Schedule There has been a lot going on lately at the 2019 IAC or International Astronautical Congress. And I haven't covered anything of it yet because there was so much going on with the starships in Boca Chica, Texas and Cocoa, Florida. So let me make up for that by at least giving you some insight into SpaceX's plans for the Starship timeline. Gwyn Shotwell, COO of SpaceX, gave a series of interviews at the Congress shedding some more light into SpaceX's target schedule for Starship development and future missions. Now Elon Musk is known for overly optimistic timelines and we've seen dates slip numerous times. So all this should be taken with a grain of salt as we're talking prototype here. You never know what might happen and what will force SpaceX to extend the timeline or might even make SpaceX shorten it if progress is faster than anticipated. So with that in mind, Shotwell yet again stated that SpaceX intends to move insanely fast. Starship is supposed to be fully orbital by the end of next year. Now what exactly does this mean? It means full stack. Starship and Super Heavy operational and Starships circling the Earth and making orbital re-entries. If this happens within only one year that would be very fast. No one has ever built a brand new system from scratch using untested methods and getting it to fly into orbit within just five years. And that five year time frame would even include the design phase. Now this gets even crazier. She also said SpaceX intends to land on the moon before 2022 and deliver cargo to the surface. So it will not be manned, but the intent of the whole mission would be to deliver the cargo in preparation for a manned landing in 2024. If SpaceX pulls this off, it will make the whole launch industry stare at the landing in disbelief. Where whole nations try to land on the moon with very small landers and fail over and over again like Israel and India most recently, SpaceX would land a 150 ton starship on the moon possibly delivering 100 tons of cargo to the surface. Furthermore, she again confirmed that Dear Moon will fly around the moon with a crew in 2023. This doesn't even feel right for me to say. It would be such a leap ahead of everyone else. I can actually fully understand the hundreds of comments I will probably get for even daring to say this on my episode. But that's what Shotwell said. I'm only repeating her words. And Shotwell had some words for us on exactly this as well. She said, Elon puts out these incredibly audacious goals and people say, you're not going to do it. You'll never get to orbit. You'll never get a real rocket to orbit. You'll never get heavy to orbit. You'll never get Dragon to the station. You'll never get Dragon back. And you'll never land a rocket. So frankly, I love when people say we can't do it because it motivates my fantastic 6,500 employees to go do that thing. Now half of my viewers will cheer and the other half will raise their arms up wildly shaking their heads. So please do tell me in the comments what you think about this timeline.
SpaceX has also already been contracted by Intuitive Machines and iSpace, both companies working with NASA, to deliver payloads to the moon ahead of its 2024 Artemis program Human Moon Landing, but these payload missions all specify using Falcon 9 to deliver the payloads. So if this timeline works out, we should see at least three moon landings done by SpaceX and partners within the next four years. Shotwell even stated during her Friday appearance that humanity could start making its way to another potentially habitable solar system within her lifetime. Amazing times. In our solar system, potentially habitable worlds are limited to just a few, with Mars being the top candidate right now. But with little favorable conditions like lack of a breathing atmosphere, low gravity and radiation, even Mars is not a perfect candidate. Have you ever wondered if there might be any other possible candidates out there? Maybe outside of our solar system? Brilliant.org, as always, has you covered. Their excellent astronomy course has a very interesting section on exoplanets. It sums up all we know about them so far. What types of exoplanets we have, what types of exoplanets we found, how we found them using gravitational wobble and transit methods, what the Goldilocks zone is and why we should aim for a planet inside of it and in the end how we could possibly reach them by achieving one of the biggest milestones imaginable. Interstellar travel. To become an exoplanet expert and at the same time support What About It, go to Brilliant.org and sign up for free to get access to their weekly brain teasers and puzzles. And if you choose to get the premium subscription, the first 200 to join through the link will get 20% off their annual premium subscription. So find out what's beyond our own little solar system with Brilliant.org. Links in the description. So this wraps up today's episode of What About It? Will Starship's legs use magnetic motors? And what do you think about SpaceX's aspirational schedule? As always, tell me in the comments. So here we are again, at the end of the episode, thanking the most amazing people in the world for their support. And I've been asked many times if it wasn't too much to thank them after every episode, but I must disagree. These people deserve to get a shout out on every single episode, because they are an integral part of funding and creating what you just saw. So everyone, please give a warm welcome to Simon Mills and Eddie Bells. You rock! Thank you for watching this episode of What About It? If you liked what you saw, remember to like and subscribe as this helps me the most. Feel free to hit me up on my Patreon page so I can get additional help in doing more and better content, as this gives me the time to focus on what I love doing the most to give you the latest and greatest about space and science. I hope to see you on the next episode. Until then, have a great time. <laughs> it would be awesome if I could do this sentence. <laughs> Mm. On the now retired noses of space shuttles, asks that the space shuttle starship space axions polite way to put what would happen. Ha happen. <laughs>